In the video today, we're answering a viewer question because Skyrunner asks us, where do insects disappear to in the wintertime? But just before we get into the video today, I want to say that it's brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community for creators with thousands of classes in design, business, and more. Unlike some websites where you have to pay for individual courses, with a premium membership from Skillshare, you get unlimited access, so you can take as many classes as you want. Now, I've been a part of other sites before where you've had to pay individually, and not only does that mean that things get pretty expensive pretty quickly, but it also means that you can't comfortably just jump into a course, get a bit of knowledge, and then jump over to something else as you need. I mean, unless you really want to shell out a ton of dough. I've recently taken a course on Skillshare on better email management. My inbox was a bit out of control, and I didn't really know how to tackle it. So I went on to Skillshare, I found something appropriate, and I set up an actual system to deal with emails rather than the train wreck that it was previously. That course is called Email Productivity Work Smarter with Your Inbox, and it's by someone called Alexandra Samuel. I'd really recommend checking it out. Anyway, join more than 7 million creators learning with Skillshare, learn along with them in groups, and get two months for free with our link below. That's a great way to support this show and support yourself. And let's get into today's video. As ectothermic, or so-called cold-blooded creatures, insects are particularly susceptible to winter's freezing temperatures. To survive, this class of life form has developed a wide variety of adaptations in order to keep on keeping on. To begin with, perhaps the best-known tactic is simple migration, with the best-known of these arguably being the monarch butterfly. Each autumn, between August and October, certain of these butterflies located in North America pick up up and head south. Those who summer east of the Rocky Mountains often spend the winter in Mexico, while those who summer west of the Rockies winter in California. Next up, we have the much more interesting adaptations of a form of hibernation, freeze avoidance, and freeze tolerance. Given many bugs eat leaves and other such things that are scarce in the winter, an alternate to continuing to attempt to scrounge for food is to find some form of shelter and then to enter diapause, which is more or less a sedate state of arrested development. This solves the nutritional problem, but there's still potentially the whole issue of sub-zero temperatures. To get around this during this stage, bugs may do things like reduce the water level in their bodies, sometimes even to the extreme like the Antarctic midge, which simultaneously accumulates sugars in their cells to lower the freezing point of the remaining water, while also reducing the amount of water to a state of almost total dehydration, which further increases the concentration of the sugar levels. On that note, it turns out that many bugs accumulate cryoprotectants, in layman's terms, that's antifreeze in the winter, and that's often glycerol. This essentially works via glycogen breaking down more and more into glycerol as the temperature drops lower and lower. As the accumulation of this in their cells and body fluids increase, so does their freeze avoidance capabilities. In addition to making their own press stone, these insects also create an environment in their bodies that is not ideal for the formation of ice nucleation in the first place. For those unaware, for ice to form at temperatures encountered by most living things, it needs a nucleation site, some small particle to form off of. Without it, water can actually go well into negative temperatures before freezing. Taking advantage of this fact, many freeze-avoidant insects have processes that reduce such particles in their bodies, such as food bits, microbes, even certain proteins that would serve as nucleation sites. This can be accomplished in such ways as ceasing to eat to clear out their digestive tract as well as getting rid of lipoproteins in their equivalent of blood. Of course, this all only goes so far, so freeze-avoidant insects often also need to find shelter. Those insects that spend the winter attached to a branch or a twig, like the goldenrod gall moth caterpillar, may also use the plant's natural defenses to create their winter igloos. In this case, as the insect is attaching itself, the plant produces a cancer-like growth in defense called a gall, which in turn will form around the creature and help protect it from the weather. In addition, many species winter as eggs or larvae, either in protected cocoons underneath piles of leaves or the like, or they may simply burrow into the soil to take advantage of the ground's slightly more temperate and regulated temperatures. This is also a much safer place to be in the winter, thanks to the extra protections the potentially frozen ground offers from hungry animals like birds. Beyond burrowing into various places for protection from the elements, some go even further to group together for added protection and warmth, such as ladybugs, who tend to huddle together and stack on top of each other inside some protected area, such as cracks in building walls or under rocks. 
Similarly, social insects like ants and termites will create deep underground colonies, sometimes well below the frost line. Here, they store ample food and keep themselves busy chowing down and working to keep the colony temperature high enough. Perhaps the most fascinating instance of this sort of thing is honeybees. Up until very recently, it was thought by many scientists that honeybee hives were kept warm by pupae in the broods and that the bees would often congregate there to warm themselves up from the pupae. Recently, this was found not to be the case when a new honeybee job was discovered, that of heater bees. Bees of almost all ages can perform this function by either vibrating their abdomens or they can also decouple their wings from their muscles, allowing them to vigorously use these muscles without actually moving their wings. This can heat their bodies up to about 111 Fahrenheit, that's 44 Celsius, which is about 16 degrees Fahrenheit, 9 degrees Celsius, hotter than their normal body temperature. Another recent discovery that went with this was why queen bees leave certain cells in the brood empty. It was previously thought this was an undesirable quality of a queen, so queens that left less empty cells were sought out. In fact, these empty cells are essential to a healthy hive. Before the discovery of heater bees using infrared technology, it was thought the bees that crawled in these empty cells were cleaning them out. What's actually happening is that the heater bees will crawl inside these cells to keep the surrounding cells at the proper temperature, able to warm a maximum of about 70 or so cells per heater bee. The heater bees can also directly regulate temperature in individual cells by standing over and pressing their thorax against a cell, something which scientists used to think was just the bees resting. In reality, they are working their wing muscles extremely hard to heat up the cell with their heightened body temperature. Why they do this has to do with job distribution. Normally, honeybee jobs are primarily assigned based on their age. However, if the hive needs more bees that are naturally inclined towards housekeeping jobs or foraging, the heater bees can adjust the temperature of certain cells to accommodate this. Raising the temperature of a cell to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees Celsius, rather than the normal cell temperature of about 93 Fahrenheit or 34 Celsius, will produce bees that are more inclined to prefer foraging jobs over housekeeping ones and vice versa, so they'll be more reluctant or more eager to change jobs than other bees their age, depending on their former cell temperature. This helps make sure that the needs of the colony can always be met, given the current state of the hive and environment. Besides performing the task of heating the brood cells, heater bees also help regulate the overall temperature of the hive. This is essential, as once their body temperature drops below about 95 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 35 degrees Celsius, they lose the ability to fly, which is why once the outside temperature drops below around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 10 degrees Celsius, you'll no longer see honeybees flying around as they're no longer capable of keeping their body temperature high enough for flight. If the temperature drops low enough, they lose the ability to move at all. Going back to heating the hive in winter, as the temperature drops, the bees all clump together towards the middle of the hive surrounding the queen. At this time, they allow the temperature of the hive to drop to around 81 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius on the inside of the cluster in order to conserve energy. Bees on the outer parts of the cluster, which will usually be capped at at least 48 degrees Fahrenheit or 9 degrees Celsius, then occasionally rotate with the bees on the more crowded inner parts so that all bees have a chance to keep warm enough to survive. Once the queen starts laying again, the temperature of the inner part of the hive will be raised back up to around 93 degrees Fahrenheit or 34 degrees Celsius. In order to support the heater bees at their job, other bees are given the job of occasionally bringing food to them as the heater bees' energy starts to run low from their constant, vigorous use of their wing muscles or vibrating to generate heat. Despite their strenuous effort, bee colonies can potentially become completely lost or lose most of their members to the cold of winter, particularly if they didn't manage to store up enough honey or certain creatures higher on the food chain take too much from them. Moving on, some insects don't enjoy the luxury of sitting the winter out and must remain directly active. For example, species like mayflies, stoneflies, and dragonflies winter as nymphs, an immature stage that resembles the adult stage, and unlike their other relatively sedate cousins, these continue to eat and grow throughout the winter, often having even greater cryoprotectants, among other adaptations, to allow for lower temperatures to further allow them to remain active without as much risk. So this all brings us around to not just freeze avoidance, but freeze tolerance. These insects have adapted to be able to turn into little insect icicles temporarily and then be thawed and go along their merry way later on. As you might imagine from this, some of these types are being studied for potential application to cryogenically freezing humans without damaging cells and tissues and things like that. 
Also interesting is that freeze-tolerant insects are significantly more common in the Southern Hemisphere – 85% of insects there versus only 29% in the Northern Hemisphere. It's thought this is the generally warmer climate, but where random cold snaps can cause temporary plunging of temperatures into the freezing levels, where the insects must be able to handle the large and sudden drop. While there are a variety of ways freeze tolerance can potentially be achieved in a given insect, many of which aren't fully understood, in the general case they accumulate their particular antifreeze chemicals, often in such a way that the cells themselves don't freeze. Instead, the insect blood or hemolymph around them does instead. When the ice does form, it also then provides something of a buffer layer to help keep the rest of them from freezing. As to the exact mechanism their bodies use to further prevent damage to cell membranes in such freezing cases, this isn't yet fully understood, though in many it does appear that they also use protein ice nucleators to help not just control the location, but rate of freezing, allowing their cells and tissues to more slowly adapt to the freezing process rather than instantly freezing at a certain point. One of the more extreme examples of this is the Pithidae beetle, which can continue to keep itself from turning into a popsicle all the way down to about minus 54 degrees Celsius, that's minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit. At this point, ice will form around the cells, but not within them, allowing them to survive for a time at even lower temperatures. And now for a bonus fact. Certain species of honeybee will actually use this heating effect as a weapon against invading insects. For instance, when attacking wasps, they've been observed to surround the wasp in a ball and then begin beating their wing muscles and vigorously vibrating. The combination of lack of oxygen for the wasp inside the ball and the drastically raised internal temperature will eventually kill the wasp. Honeybees will also use this heat balling technique to kill the queen when necessary, such as when the queen is no longer capable of performing her duties and a new queen is installed. This is often called cuddle death. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below. Also, don't forget to check out our wonderful sponsor, Skillshare, who made this video possible. That is linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.